me your word, oh God, so I can mature, oh God. Enlighten my mind, oh God, set me apart, oh God. I am your disciple, I'm your disciple, Lord. For your kingdom. All for your kingdom, God. Fill me with wisdom, Fill me with wisdom Bring now. Understanding. Bring understanding to my mind. Nights live with Brandon, and thank you for tuning in. Uh, we're looking forward to a powerful time with you this evening, and uh, just let me know if the sound is clear on your end. And uh, we are ready to go. Thank you, family. Bishop Botica, I see you. Let me just welcome a few and greet a few. Bishop Botica, I see you. Thank you so much for tuning in. Rafik, welcome. Lebo, I see you. Devon, I see you. Netley, I see you. Calvin, so good having you on. All the way from Cape Town, Apostle Ash, I see you, man of God. Uh, thank you so much. Let the guys know that we are live. Let them know we are ready to run. Mel, I see you. Desmond, bad boy, thank you. Ishmael, I see you. And we are good to go. We had to take a small two-week uh, two break. Uh, unfortunately, we had to deal with some uh, ground-level work and uh, matters that needed our urgent attention. And that is why we were not live for the past two weeks. Uh, be that as it may, the work has to continue. And I thank you also for your patience, uh, for understanding that I could not be live the past two weeks, uh, but we had to come back on tonight uh, and conclude on our a teaching uh, on Mammon. So thank you for your patience and also understanding that, you know, once in a while, there's certain things that needs our urgent attention and we have to set our priorities in place. So thank you for your Patience with us, and we are back. Amu Epsibai, I see you. Nariz, I see you. Lydia Adams, I see you. Thank you so much. Petri Gon, welcome, man of God. So good having you on as well. Thank you. Uh, all the way from the free state, uh, Pastor Nsakani Mosia, thank you so much, man of God. So good having you on as well. Uh, we continue with our conversation on Mammon this evening, and we are concluding this conversation as well. It would be week four. And there's a few things that I still have to round up. Uh, we ended it so, you know, just so suddenly for those two weeks. So I was ready two weeks ago with this particular teaching, and we're going to jump into it in a short while. Fat Kit, I see you as well. Thank you so much. Fat Kit and I are working on a little project that will be coming out, uh, let me say, in the next week or two, in the next few weeks. I hope that doesn't put too much pressure on him. But we should be ready with that in the next few weeks. You know, that is how we get the work done. We give a timeline, amen? <laughs> mm. uh, but we can't say too much about it, but it's coming out soon. A little project we were working on by the grace of God. Elmeri, so good seeing you. Uh, bless you, woman of God. Well, let's get into the word this evening. Uh, also, family, you have the opportunity to sow. Before I get into the word, all the details for sowings on the screen. Those of you that continuously give on this platform, we thank you so much. We appreciate you. And we pray that what you sow on this platform, that God returns the same to you a thousand times more. Uh, we see your generosity. We see your offerings. The only request I have is when you make an offering, please use your name as a reference number. Uh, or as a reference, rather. Uh, it helps us to track who's giving and who's sowing. And, you know, it's always good for us when we decide to give out free gifts. We normally send it to people that are sowing uh, into the ministry. We do that periodically. So if you put your name on the uh, offering, we are able to track you and we are able to trace the offering back to you so that when we do have specials, you then become the first beneficiary 
of some of the specials that we run from time to time. So please use your name as a reference. It helps us to track those offerings as well. We get in offerings and we don't have a clue who send it. So please put your name down as well. Alvino, I trust you are feeling well. You are better. We're praying for you, man of God. So good seeing that you are on. And I hope you're still taking the break as I instructed you. But good having you on, man of God. Thank you. So let's get into the word this evening. We are on Mammon Week 4. Put in the comment section Mammon Week 4. You're right, Bishop Wotika. You were on first this evening, man. Uh, normally it's Lebu. It's Devon. Uh, but you beat them too with this evening. Amen. And we have a few guys that are normally on first, but you beat them too, too with this evening. Jonathan Dose. So good having you, man of God. Michelle Bart, I see you. Well, let's get into the word. Enough of these pleasantries and these exchanges now. Let's get into the word. I'm going to have to recap because with that two-minute uh, layover, that two-week rather, layover, uh, we probably lost track to the conversation. So I'm going to recap where we ended off on week three so that we can all be on the same page. Amen. Keep on saying two minutes, man. I sound like a preacher that says, give me two more minutes. Two weeks, not two minutes. Yvonne, so good having you back, woman of God. one of our daughters out in Botswana, freelance journalist, doing an amazing job in the field of journalism. So good having you on, Yvonne. Thank you so much for tuning in this evening. Cheslin, I see you as well. Seho, we're just getting started, so you are still safe. So we are on Mammon Week 4, and I want to recap a few things quickly. So what we've established, though, was that Mammon is that which appeal, appeals to our insecurities, our fears, and our doubts. And we established also that mammon is not just money. We established that mammon offers us platform, uh, influence, rank, and power. Those were the things we established as far as the conversation of mammon is concerned. Uh, in week three, we ended it off when we spoke at length about how mammon uh, comes and it looks for a weakness within us and it appeals to that. And we ended it off where Jesus said, uh, Peter, I have prayed for you uh, because Satan seeks to sift you. And we began to explain what that sifting process entails. And we looked at Jesus where he said, the prince of this world is coming, but he has absolutely nothing in me. Those were some of the things we shared uh, embedded onto our platform is the teaching. So you are able to go back into the teaching and to just, you know, go back and understand what we are talking about and where we are. So Lofela Motsisi, I see you as well, all the way from Botswana as well. Thank you so much, woman of God. Anselin, I see you. Thank you. Bless you. And so this week, we're on week four. I'm going to look at a few things, and I'm going to show you how mammon creates perversion and what perversion is and explain that to you. And we're going to look at how mammon begins to pervert things that God wants to maintain and preserve in its most integrous form Then how mammon perverts those things and what happens when that perversion enters our spirit man and that perversion begins to work and also going to look at how that perversion appeals to us amen those are some of the things we're going to look at there's quite a number of verses lengthy portion of scripture i i have to read uh but we're going to work with it and labor on it our foundational text for this evening is matthew chapter 6 verse 24 matthew chapter 6 verse 24 if you can get it for me into the comment section i would be so appreciative Bishop Trout, my good friend, so good having you on. I saw the video of you dancing the other night. I was like, man, the bishop and his wife can still move, man. Uh, you know, we call it in our circles, we call it lang arm dance of pop. I can't do any of that, so I'm watching your video to get some tips. Welcome, Bishop Trout. <laughs> Amen. Camelia, my cousin, I see you. Thank you so much, sis. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. It says, no one is able to serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and he will love the other. He will be devoted to the one and he will despise the other. You are not able to serve God and mammon. You are not able to serve God and mammon. You are not able to serve God and mammon. Now, again, we're going to look at what mammon does when it seeks to preserve certain things in your life. Amen. So let me recap quickly. We established that mammon rewards you with four things. Rank slash status platform influence and power 
those are the things that mammon rewards you with but in turn mammon wants your soul to be corrupted mammon wants you to go into a perverse expression of the gifted individual you are but it rewards you with that and in exchange for your soul this is what mammon gives you and once mammon grabs a hold of your soul it then is able to perpetuate its agenda through you that is what we've established now let me say this to you mammon gives you things and it places you in a cycle where you have to preserve those things now the only way you can preserve and protect the agenda of mammon uh, is when mammon does this type of exchange with you when the rich man approached jesus and jesus said to him sell everything you have and follow me jesus was not against wealth but jesus was testing who is the lord of his life who is the master of his life and he says to jesus something profound he says i've upheld the entirety of the law i've kept the commands of moses and then jesus says no that's beautiful but i have one final test for you sell everything you have and give your money to the poor and then follow me it's a very interesting statement because the word follow jesus only used that particular word when he was recruiting disciples jesus never used the word follow uh, just haphazardly or casually but the word follow was a phrase that jesus only used when he was recruiting disciples so when you see the recruitment of the 12 you would notice jesus used that word follow me uh, it's the same phrase that elijah uses when he goes and he recruits elisha the scripture says that Elisha is plowing with 12 oxen, which is, a de again, the symbolism there is very deep, but I'm not going to get into it. And he says he, he throws his mantle over him and he instructs him to follow him. So the word follow was a historical term that was used in a Jewish context when a master recruits a disciple. But what you would notice in scripture is that the master always recruited a disciple from a formal place of employment. So when Jesus recruits Peter... Peter is busy fishing. When Elijah recruits Elisha, Elisha is busy plowing the land. Uh, when Jesus recruits some of his other disciples, they are busy with their work. And the reason why Jesus would go into these spaces and recruit them is it was always testing issues of lordship. You understand what I'm saying? Because the work in that context became a form of provision and preservation. And uh, wealth in that context was a form of provision and uh preservation and jesus would always throw the word follow into that context so the rich man as label rightly placed it there was recruited into being a disciple of jesus christ but he missed the opportunity because issues of lordship in his heart was not settled and this is why jesus never recruited people from a place that did not give them provision Everybody was recruited from a place of provision. And this is why sometimes full-time ministry can become such a contentious issue because we always have this backup plans for the things of God. But Jesus calls us out of that context because he's testing issues of lordship. Now, if something gives you success, if something gives you protection, if something gives you provision, if something gives you status, if it gives you platform, if it gives you influence, if it gives you rank, if it gives you power, it is always difficult for you to abandon that. So even though the, the, the rich ruler had a, and I'm just using this for illustration purposes, we are going somewhere. Even though he followed the law of Moses, the rich young ruler did not settle issues of lordship in his heart. Do you understand what I'm saying? And this is where you can have a form of godliness, but not fully engaged in the power of godliness and that is very critical for us to understand because everybody gets called from a place of preservation protection provision god never calls a person that have not mastered or experienced that at some level in life and so the rich young ruler passes the test of the law but he does not pass the test of lordship the ultimate test that every individual has to pass is not just upholding the Ten Commandments, but it is passing the test of Lordship. Because the Ten Commandments can give us a moral qualification, and yet still outside of that moral context or that moral compass we have adopted for life, we're still wrestling with issues of Lordship. Are you following me? And those things become critical. 
And this is why God always calls us from things that are working. He never calls us from things that are not working. That's why I become very skeptical about somebody that gets called from things that are not working. If you get called from things that are not working, then preaching the gospel is a backup plan. It is not a calling. It is not a first love. It is not a command of the spirit. Are you following me? And so those things become crucial. So very important that we understand that. Now, here's the thing with a rich young ruler. The status, the influence, the fame that he have attained because of that, he did not believe that Jesus can give it to him. He did not believe Jesus could give it to him. And he misses the opportunity to become a disciple that would later evolve into an apostle and a world changer. So even though he was able to uphold the law morally, he did not settle issues of lordship in his heart. And this is why you can have good people that follow God, but he's not their Lord entirely. And so they can be morally correct, but still not have him as Lord over their lives. This means they can come to church, they can partake in church things, but when you really test them at a higher level, you can see that their work, their careers, their business is still Lord of their life. And those things become crucial. And unfortunately, it also becomes a tool of manipulation and a bargaining tool when people want certain things done. So mammon confronts issues of lordship in your life. Let me put it to you this way. If you come from a church and you are very influential, a powerful worship leader, and everybody knows you, and you come to another church and they tell you to sit down, you're not going to sing. What's being tested? Is Jesus Lord or is your flesh Lord? What's being tested? Is Jesus Lord or is your flesh Lord? Because the Lordship of Jesus will give you a seat, not a stage. And for the rich young ruler, he had worldly success that followed him up to that stage in his life. Why would he want to lose that for this man that claims to be the savior of the world? Why? Are you following me? So it is very important for you to understand that. And so when we talk about lordship, we have to ask, are you willing to lose your rank? Are you willing to lose your platform? Are you willing to lose your influence? Are you willing to lose your power for the namesake of the Lord? And that becomes key. Now, when Mammon gives you this, Mammon wants to preserve it and the way that Mammon preserves it is by perverting your calling, by perverting your gift, by perverting you as an individual. So even though you know the truth, Mammon perverts that because in order to retain your seat at the table, you have to function in a form of perversion. And the word perversion simply means twist or bend the truth. That is really what the word perversion means. It simply means twist or bend the truth so that you can be accepted, validated, and received. And we have a perfect picture of how perversion begins to govern the lives of prophetic people uh, in the scripture. Go with me to 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 1 to 6. It's a teaching platform, so you're going to have to listen to me and work with me. 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 1 to 6. And this is the thing. So here's how it works. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. So when God calls, let's say he calls Logan to be an evangelist, that gift hits Logan's spirit man in its perfect, pure, unadulterated form. Are you following me? There's nothing corrupt about the gift. And what Mammon does, Mammon comes and Mammon offers you reward for your performance. And then what was righteous now becomes twisted. What was righteous becomes twisted. It becomes bent out of shape. And that is the danger with mammon. Are you hearing me? Very important. Now let's look at how the prophetic, and again, I'm just using the prophetic for illustration purposes. Uh, we can use many examples, but I'm teaching, so I'm using the prophetic as an example. Amen. First Kings 22, verse 1 to 6. Let's read it quickly. It says, For three years, 
there was no war between Aram and Israel. But in the third year, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, went down to see the king of Israel. Now, again, you must understand, and again, this is just history lesson. Uh, Judah and Israel was when the kingdoms became divided, when the nation of Israel became divided and it was split into two. So the one end was called Judah, the other end was called Israel. Okay, that's just a little history lesson that I'm not going to jump into and explain in detail, but I'm just giving it to you so you understand the difference between the two. The king of Israel said to the officials, do you know that Ramad Gilead belongs to us and we are doing nothing to retake it from the king of Aram? So we asked Jehoshaphat, uh, and this is Ayyab asking him, well, will you go with me to fight against Ramad Gilead? Jehoshaphat replied to the king, I am as you are. My people are as your people, my horses as your horses. But Jehoshaphat also said to the king of Israel, let's first seek the counsel of the Lord. Now watch this. So the king of Israel brought together the prophets, about 400 men, and asked them, shall I go to war against Ramad Gilead or shall I refrain? Listen to what the prophet says. The prophet says, go, for the Lord will give it into the king's hand. Now, I don't want to get into much detail. When you read the entirety of that scripture, Jehoshaphat is not happy with this definition or this instruction from the prophets. And he says, man, I heard 400 men prophesy, but is there still one prophet of the Lord that we can inquire from? And they say that there's Micaiah, but he only prophesies nonsense and he only prophesies against the king. Uh, so we don't want to hear him. And then they eventually call Micaiah and Micaiah tells them that, listen, man, all these 400 prophets were wrong. And it becomes a whole different scenario. But here's what I want to zero in on. 400 prophets who genuinely have a prophetic gift, but their prophetic gift is perverted because they have a seat at the king's table. And so they can no longer prophesy truth. They only prophesy what the itching ears of the king wants to hear. And you now begin to see how perversion begins to hit them because in order to protect their influence, they have to prophesy favorably. Now, when we bring this into a 21st century context, one of the things you will notice is that generally in spaces where we have to protect our seed, we generally develop lies. And we become perverted to a large extent because we have to preserve what is working and paying the bills. And so our word and our narrative becomes corrupted. Do you understand what I'm saying? And this is why you would notice people move from one extreme to the other extreme. So you would have a church context and this person would be submitted. This person would be honorable. This person would be serving. And then somebody else gives him a bigger offer. Now he has to speak ill and he has to invent lies about where he once was so that he can preserve his seat in the new space. And so what happened with these particular prophets is that even though they could prophesy the truth, they chose not to prophesy the truth, lest they lose their rank, lest they lose their platform, lest they lose their influence. And the gift of God then becomes perverted to a large extent where they are only fighting to preserve the things that maintains the success narrative. And this is very dangerous, and it happens so often in the church context. You would see somebody come up, and over the years, you would notice the person's message changes. You would notice the person's relationship changes. You would notice the way the person lives out his calling or his assignment. It completely changes. And what a person judged in one seat, he... In one season of his life, he is now a friend of it and exchanging pleasantries with it in another season of his life. And what has happened is the purity of the gift is lost and the gift is now functional in a form of perversion. It is now functional in a form of perversion. And, and the word perversion comes from the Greek word matastrepho. Uh, let me just spell that for you. It comes from the word metastrepho, M-E-T-A-S-T-R-E-P-H-O, metastrepho. And it means to change the purpose of something, to corrupt God's intention or to corrupt the thing from its purest expression. Are you following me? To corrupt the thing and, and, and to twist it that it no longer looks like, it, that it no longer exists in its purest form. And that suggests that when the enemy begins to provide for us 
the gifted becomes perverted because gifts and callings are irrevocable. So nobody can take away your gift, but mammon can corrupt your gift and bend it so out of shape that you develop a lying tongue. That you develop a lying tongue. And these prophets prophesied with what I call a lying tongue. Are you following me? And why did they do that? Because the king gave them status, gave them power, gave them influence, gave them rank. And anybody that prophesies differently loses his seat at the table. And that is how perversion begins to come in. Now watch this. And I said this to you a few weeks ago. Everybody desires success. Everybody desires success. And it is the desire of success that ultimately corrupts us. And there's times where you are literally flabbergasted when you look at somebody and you ask yourself, like, are you for real? Like, can you lie like that? Why? Because mammon must be preserved. And the only way you can preserve what mammon gave you is by coming perverted in your expression. And so what happened is you're still a prophet, but all purity of the prophetic is gone. And this now is how perversion comes in. And the entire expression of the gifted individual becomes twisted. Put in the comment section, it becomes twisted. And so we lose integrity. We lose the purity of the expression. And we now function in a crooked, twisted, perverted way. And that crooked, twisted, and perverted way is really committed to self-preservation. And it no longer perpetuates the agenda of the kingdom. It no longer perpetuates the agenda of the kingdom. And so Memon corrupts the person. And that corruption is now a perverted expression of the prophetic. So here's the thing. People start out in purity. But somewhere down the line... They become perverted. And this is why we are now able to say that, man, a few years ago, this guy was really speaking the truth. Now he's just going with the flow. That is perversion. A few years ago, this guy was just fearless in how he did the work of God. But now he just says what the people want to hear. That is a form of perversion. Do you understand what I'm saying? A few years ago, this person was deeply committed, but now he's just attacking the body of Christ. He's just attacking the church what's happening there is a form of perversion are you following me and perversion is always after self-preservation so your ministry belongs to the highest bidder and that is how we produce perverted ministry nobody can take away your gift but mammon can pervert your gift are you following me And this is the danger of self-preservation. And the, the, the test for us has always been self-preservation. It's always been self-preservation. This is why the calling revolves around death. One of the things we have to understand when God calls you, the calling revolves around death. I'll say that one more time. The calling of God revolves around death. And this is why you would notice the apostles preached extensively on dying to self. They preached extensively on nailing our desires to the cross. They preached extensively on burying the old man and coming out as the new man. So the calling of God revolves around death. And we have too many individuals preaching and prophesying for God that is very much alive in their flesh and they are not dead to self. And this is why when God genuinely calls a person, he calls them from the things that gives them meaning and definition, and he causes that to die. And when he dies, you are resurrected as a new man because a dead man no longer has old selfish desires. And this is the problem. We are producing a generation of believers that are too alive. We are producing a generation of believers that are way too alive. They are too alive. The calling of God revolves around death.
And it's very important that we understand it. And when you look at, at the epistles, the way it describes Jesus, and I speak under correction, but I think it's it's it's, it's the, the, the book of James that says it. It says that he was obedient even unto death, or he was obedient even unto the cross. Do you understand what I'm saying? So it's very key for you to understand when God calls a man, he kills a man. Put that in the comment section. When God calls a man, he kills a man. When God calls a man, he kills a man. Put it in the comment section. And we have people that are way too alive for ministry. We have a generation way too alive for ministry. And that is always the opening for mammon. And what was pure becomes entirely perverted. And that form of perversion then continues to perpetuate a self-serving agenda and the gospel becomes twisted. And that is where the danger is. Now, I'm going to go into a scripture here. It's quite a lengthy reading, so I'm probably going to skip some of the uh, verses, uh, but I'm going to just extract a few thoughts from it to show you how this generation and the previous generation, how they work and how mammon causes them to form a network of the corrupt or how to form a network of perversion. Are you following me? Go with me to 1 Kings chapter 13. I really want to read from verse 1 up to 30, but that is such a lengthy reading, so I'm going to jump some of these verses so that we can get to where I want to get to, okay? Sometimes on my platform, we read so much, you would think it's a book club, amen? You must never forget that when God calls a man, he kills a man. That's why the Apostle Paul wrote and he says, everything I have lived out in my previous life, it was meaningless. It is dead to me. It no longer exists. I'm a new man. Are you following me? When God calls a man, he kills a man. Well, let's get into it. First Kings chapter 13. First Kings chapter 13. And, I, and again, Thessalonica, why we read is because we have a generation that don't read Bible anymore. We preach about everything, man. Somebody burns their clothes and that becomes a sermon. This morning I was ironing and I accidentally burned my pants and I thought to myself, like, is the Lord telling me how we will burn in hell? We preach about everything and, and God forbid that we go down that route. Amen. We preach about everything. We spill the water here. You know, I was drinking water and the water spilled. And I said, this must be what an outpouring of the Holy Spirit looks like. First Kings chapter 13. We preach about everything, man. I'm so tired of this generation, man. God will grant us grace, eh? <laughs> you you, you got to work with me, man. You got to work with me. Sometimes you're going to hear my irritations and my annoyance, but God will help us, amen? God will help us. God will help us. First Kings chapter 13, verse 1 to 13. Now, I want you to follow something here because this is such a deep portion of Scripture. Such a deep portion of Scripture. And there's so much happening in this portion of Scripture. It says, By the word of the Lord, a man of God came from Judah to Bethel. Now, again, already I have a problem. I have a problem here. And the problem that I have is the following. Why did God not use a prophet from Bethel, but he sent a prophet from Judah? What was wrong with the prophets in Bethel? Are you following me? But we're going to get into it in a minute. Amen. As Jerobeam was standing by the altar to make an offering, by the word of the Lord, he cried out against the altar. Altar, altar. You in South Africa, you African, you'll say altar. Altar, altar. Whatever, man. This is what the Lord says. A son named Josiah will be born to the house of David. On you he will sacrifice the priest of the high places who makes offerings here, and human bones will be burned on you. That same day the man of God gave a sign. This is the sign the Lord has declared. The altar will be split apart and the ashes will be poured out. 
when King Jehoiakim heard what the man of God cried out against the altar at Bethel, he stretched out his hand from the altar and says, seize him. But the hand he stretched out towards the man of God shriveled up so that he could not pull it back. Also, the altar was split apart and its ashes, is, and its ashes poured out according to the sign given. Uh, the king said to the man of God, intercede for the Lord your God and pray for me that my hand may be restored. So the man of God interceded with the Lord and the king's hand was restored and became as it was before. The king said to the man of God, come home with me for a meal and I will give you a gift. But the man of God answered the king and said, even if you were to give me half your possessions, I would not go with you, nor would I eat bread or drink water, for I was commanded by the Lord, you must not eat or drink water or return by the way you came. In other words, you must not speak of fellowship with anybody. So he took another road and did not return by the way he had come. Now, now here's where the story gets interesting. Now, there was a certain old prophet living in Bethel, whose sons came and told him all that a man of God had done there that day. They also told their father what he had said to the king. Notice this is a prophet. What he had said to the king. What was my opening question? Why did God not use the prophets in Bethel? He had to send a prophet from Judah. The story is beginning to make sense for you now. Are you with me? Their father asked them which way. Their father asked them. That's a good question, Anselm. Why is the prophet addressing the altar as he would a person? That one only comes with an offering, my friend. So I'm not going to answer that tonight. That one I'm going to answer with an offering. Amen. Uh, verse 13. So he said, <laughs> I asked them, which way did they go? And the son showed him which road the man of God from Judah had taken. So he said to his son, settle the donkey for me. And when they had settled the donkey for him, he mounted it and rode after the man of God. He found him sitting under an oak tree and uh, asked, are you the man of God who came from Judah? I am, he replied. So the prophet said to him, come home with me and eat. The man of God said, I cannot turn back and go with you, nor can I eat bread or drink water or return by the way you came. The old prophet, now here's where it gets interesting. The old prophet answered, I too am a prophet as you are. And an angel said to me by the word of the Lord, he's lying. He's now lying. The prophetic is perverted. Bring him back with you to your house. So that he may eat bread and drink water. But he was lying to him. So the man of God returned with him and ate and drank in the house. While they were sitting at the table, the word of the Lord came to the old prophet who had brought him back. The old prophet, he cried out to the man of God who had come from Judah. He says, this is what the Lord says. You have defied the word of the Lord and you have not kept the command of the Lord your God. You came back and ate bread and drank water in the place where he told you not to eat. In the place where he told you not to eat or drink. Therefore, your body will not be buried in the tomb of your ancestors. Now, when you read the story further, the young prophet dies. And uh, I'm not going to read all of it because it's quite a bit of reading to do. The young prophet dies. And uh, the word of the Lord comes to pass from the mouth of the old prophet. Now, here's two things we have to look at quickly. And I'm going to labor this for you. God sends a prophet from Judah to go and prophesy in Bethel. Why they have an old prophet in Bethel? Why? Because when the prophetic in one region becomes corrupt, God sends purity from another region. Because what God is after is not a perverted expression of the prophetic, but what God is committed to is the purity of the prophetic. So even though the old prophet could prophesy, he's been so corrupted and his gift has been so perverted that God could not trust him with kingdom matters. And so God sends a young prophet. The word young there is not necessarily age, but it, is, it, it, it denotes the idea of purity. Because when you are young, you are still pure in your assignment. Are you following me? So, so, so the, the, the terminology, I want you to understand the symbolism here. Old prophet, young prophet, old prophet, young prophet. Those words can be replaced with novice, experienced. Do you understand what I'm saying? Novice, experienced. Uh, those words can be replaced with that. The old prophet cannot be, cannot be commissioned by God to deliver this message because they have become corrupt in Bethel. And so God sends somebody that's not been corrupted. But here's the problem. Here's the problem. I'm, I'm trying to paint a picture for you. Sometimes as young people, we can be so obsessed with validation that we bypass the instruction of God that the old corrupt system can lay hands on us. 
And the young man is obsessed with validation and recognition and obsessed with relevance. And we form a partnership birth out of perversion because the old man needs the young man to remain relevant and the young man needs the old man uh, for validation and for acceptance. And there's a form of corruption that enters the relational dynamic and everything about it becomes twisted because now I'm relating with an old prophet because I need him to validate me and the old prophet is too happy to relate with me because he needs me for relevance. And what happens is it becomes the alliance of the perverted. in the comment section it becomes the alliance of the perverted and this is what plays out daily in our own context you have a young man coming up god wants to protect the purity of his assignment but a young man wants validation wants recognition wants acceptance wants somebody to clap for him so he go and he finds an old man that is no longer on the scene and that old man endorses him the old man is too happy to endorse him because the old man on the other hand needs a young emerging gift to maintain his relevance and so there's nothing pure about the partnership it becomes the alliance of the perverted my god i'm preaching so good tonight i'm gonna give myself an offering So watch this. God gives the young prophet an instruction, speak to nobody. But because an old prophet would experience as God spoke, he forgets what God said, and he enters into what I call the alliance of the perverted. And this is what happens all the time. Because when God calls us, God raises us up separate from an established system that might be corrupt. And this is what I always say to the children in Telios. I always say to my children in Telios, corruption is old. Corruption is old. If you understand what that means, corruption is old. A young politician does not become corrupt without the, without the mentorship of an old politician. A young, young prophet does not become corrupt without the mentorship of an old prophet. Because corruption is old. And so here's what happens now. So the young prophet now completely ignores divine instruction. And he goes with an old prophet because we always attach legitimacy to age. And this is a mistake we make all the time in the kingdom. Now, let me say this and let me just put out this disclaimer because, you know, uh, Facebook people always misinterpret what you're saying. So let me just put out this disclaimer. We are not in any shape, form, or way suggesting that if somebody or something is old, they are corrupt. But what we are saying in the context of the scripture we are using, that an old prophet represented a corrupt system and he contaminated the prophet from Judah. Now we answer the question, why did God not use the old prophet who was already in Bethel? Why did God not use the old prophet who was already stationed in Bethel? We have to put out disclaimers because there's a whole lot of clowns that sometimes watch out things and they want to create a viral moment. Amen. So I'm just saying it away, these men. Why did God not use the old prophet who was already stationed in Bethel? Because the prophetic in Bethel has become so corrupt that God had to send somebody that was outside of their context. The prophetic in Bethel had become so corrupt that God had to send somebody that was outside of their context. Are you hearing me? And it is very important for us to understand that. When you look within that context, you no longer see how bad it is. When you live in that context, you no longer see how bad it is. So it takes a prophet from Judah that's not been contaminated by the system in Bethel to speak a pure, unadulterated word.
And the reason why God says to him, speak to nobody was because God understood what was brewing in Bethel. The first man he encounters is a corrupt king at an altar. The second person that he encounters is an old prophet who's corrupt. The old prophet is seeking relevance. The young prophet is seeking validation. And they form the alliance of the corrupt. And it's very important that we understand these things because if we don't understand these things, we will continue in this way. So we have to get this right. And so the old prophet symbolizes a season, but he has become corrupted. He's become perver perverted. And here now, they are able to bridge that and to form an ungodly partnership. So what's happening, the old man can lay his hand on and say, this is the new gatekeeper of the city. And by virtue of this one ascending, He's able now, he's now able to explain and the one feeds the other. And this is how Mammon then finds preservation within a ministry expression. So even the relationships become corrupt because the old prophet has no interest in the young prophet. The young prophet has no interest in the old prophet. But you give me relevance, I give you validation. It's a win-win for both of us. So let's just run with it. You understand what I'm saying to you? They have no interest in each other. But you, you validate me. I make you relevant. Let's just run with it. And that is the danger that we have in this generation. And so when God gets ready to raise up somebody, he begins to raise up that person away from the system, lest mammon grab the hold of that person. I'm going to show you at least three places in Scripture where God grooms gifts and graces away from the established system. Are you still there? So what matters to God is the integrity and the purity of the assignment. What matters to God is the integrity and the purity of the assignment. And so when God protects a grace against mammon and the perversion that governs the established system, he always separates them from the established system. 1 Kings 13, 7, 8. I want you to see three places of separation. For the gifted. And we read it now. But I'm going to read it again. The king said to the man of God. Come home with me for a meal. And I will give you a God. Listen to how God grooms this young prophet. But the man of God answered the king. Even if you were to give me half of your possessions. I cannot go what you knock. And I eat what you knock. And I drink water with you. For I was commanded by the word of the Lord. You must not eat bread or drink water. Or return by the way you came. Again bread. What does it symbolize? Doctrine. Jesus said I am the bread of life. Eat of me. What does wine or water symbolize? Water symbolizes revelation and the purification of the person. Are you with me? So he says you must not eat bread or drink water. Deals with issues of doctrine. That's symbolism there, right? Are you following me? Let's look at another place where God separates a man that is grooming and is protecting the purity and the integrity of the assignment. 2 Kings 4.29. Elisha said to Gehazi, tuck your clothes into your belt Take my staff in your hand and run. Do not speak to anyone you meet along the way. You see the same instruction. Do not speak to anyone you meet along the way. Let's look at the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. Galatians chapter 1 verse 11 to 20. Galatians chapter 1 verse 11 to 20. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that a gospel that I preach... And our Bible study guys would know this one off by heart now. Amen. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that a gospel I preach is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age amongst my own people, and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when, the, when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb, set apart, called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me, so that I may preach him amongst the Gentiles. Listen to this. My immediate response was not to consult or confer with any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles. I did not go up to Jerusalem to be authenticated by the established system. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before me. 
I didn't go up to Jerusalem to meet with the gatekeepers. I didn't go up to Jerusalem to sit and seek validation and endorsement. I didn't go up to Jerusalem so that they can make me something. I didn't go up to Jerusalem so that they can accept me and recognize me. I didn't go and meet with them so that they can put up a picture of me and tell them that I'm the gatekeeper of the city. Are you following the text? But I went to Arabia. Later, I returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem. To do what? To get acquainted with Cephas. And I stayed with him for 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that what I am writing to you is no lie. It's a profound portion of scripture. So what Paul was saying is that I didn't go up and introduce myself and seek validation or acceptance from the old apostolic order. But when the time was right and I was of sober mind and I was sober in my spirit, then only I went up. But by the time I came there, the revelation and the message in my spirit was so established that none of them could corrupt it. Because when you begin to read further in the book of Galatians, you see a contentious issue rise up that most of the apostles in Jerusalem subscribe to, that the Gentiles should be circumcised. But God keeps the Apostle Paul away from that so that he can protect the purity of his revelation. And when Paul fully understands that the Gentiles does not need circumcision in their bodies, but their hearts are circumcised, then God sends him up to the Apostles in Jerusalem, not so that they can just validate him and endorse him, but so that he can teach them. Do not place unnecessary burdens on the Gentiles. So if Paul went to them prematurely, his message would be corrupted and it would not exist in its purest and most integrous form. Are you hearing the man of God this evening? So here's what you have to understand when God calls you. He creates a context for purity. God creates a context for purity. But the success narrative of the established system makes us use each other. And that is a form of perversion that denies us the purity of the relationship and the purity of networking. So we sit at a table because we're using one another. We network with each other because we're using one another. We become friends because we're using one another. We exchange platforms because we're using one another. And there is no purity in our operation because our word cannot exist outside of that context in its purest form. And when you become a platform junkie, you're everybody's friend. Put in the comment section, teach apostle. And that is the danger. That is the danger. And so God keeps Paul pure because God knows they're debating circumcision. God keeps Paul pure because God knows circumcision is a contentious issue. God keeps Paul pure because God knows if he goes into that mess right now, they will pervert this young apostle that is emerging. And Paul understands that God called me, not man. Paul does not crave validation. He does not crave acceptance. He does not crave recognition. And so you know when this apostle emerges, his message is going to be pure. Because he's not after anybody's platform. He's not after anybody's money. He's not after anybody's stage. He's not desiring to be on anybody's uh, pamphlet. He's not desiring to be on any TV channel. He's coming with a pure, unadulterated message of God. Because Paul understands when God calls a man, he kills a man. Woo. He understands that when God calls a man, he kills a man. And by the time he meets these apostles in Jerusalem, he is dead. Dead man walking. They are speaking to a dead man. He has no desire for popularity. He has no desire for stage. He has no desire for open doors. They are speaking to a dead man. And that becomes the premise and the foundation of his message. And he does not make the mistake that a young prophet made in 1 Kings chapter 13. He cannot allow an old prophet to pull him from the grip of grace. So how do we deal with mammon? We die to self. We must be dead men walking. 
Man, we're going to give you a stage, change your message. I'm dead. I don't desire it. Man, we're going to give you money, change your message. I'm dead. I have no desire for it. If I'm coming, I'm coming with my own message. If I'm coming, I'm coming with a message in its purest form. If I'm coming, I'm not twisting it. I'm not chopping it. I'm not changing it a certain way. If I'm coming, you're going to have to receive me in my measure and not make me into who you want me to be. And so when they meet in Jerusalem, they meet a dead man walking. Put in the comment section, in the comment section, dead man walking. And that becomes the premise for a pure, unadulterated message that cannot be perverted. That cannot be perverted. So it's important for us to understand this. How do we deal with mammon? We die to self. We must be a dead man walking. When you reach a stage in your life where you don't desire a platform, when you don't desire your face on a pamphlet, on a pamphlet, when you don't desire people's money, when you don't desire people's popularity, you can be trusted with the gospel. You can be trusted with the gospel. And God is looking for a generation he can trust with the gospel. He's looking for a generation he can trust with the gospel. I pray that a generation, at least from this platform, emerges that can be trusted with the gospel. I don't need a lot of people to get this. But if I can just get 20 people on this feet, 20 people on this feet that can be trusted with the gospel, my job is done. My job is done. I don't know who I'm speaking to. And I'm taking a bit of a different turn here. But if you are that person, I want you to put in the comment section, I can be trusted with the gospel. And I'm going to pray a strong prayer for you as we come to a close. If you're that person, put in the comment section, I can be trusted with the gospel. Very important. And I'm going to pray specifically for that group that puts that in. I can be trusted with the gospel. It's very important that we catch this. Very, very important that we catch this. And I want you to share this message, to take it as far as it can, because we are breaking strongholds in this generation. We are breaking strongholds. And I'm going to pray for you. There's a reason why I walk the way I walk. There's a reason why I live my life the way I love it. There's a reason why I am the person that I am. Because there's a whole lot of things going on. And it's important for me to be trusted with my message. Ah, there's more than 20 years. It's just coming. Put it, I can be trusted with the gospel before I pray. I sense the anointing of God so strong here. I don't know about you, but I sense it here this evening. If you can sense that anointing, just put up your hand, man. I sense the anointing. Something's going to break off this generation. Come on. Bless you, Lord. 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 And so we pray now, Lord, for this generation. We pray now for this particular group on this feed this evening, Lord. I commit them to you. I pray, Lord, that you would keep them pure. That they would die to self daily. That the appetite for being a celebrity would die. That the appetite for fame would cease. That the drive for mammon would cease. And that they would preach the unadulterated gospel of Jesus Christ and shift their generation. I release boldness upon you now. I charge you now with boldness. I charge you now with boldness. And I decree that the words that you speak will not fall to the ground. That the Lord himself will lift you. That the Lord himself will cause his face to shine upon you. That the Lord himself will open doors for you and create platform for you where you are not compromised. And that you will say, thus say the Lord, without any fear. Without any doubt, that grace I charge you with now, the same boldness and authority that I walk in, I release that upon you now. The same fearlessness that I walk in, I release that upon you now. In Jesus' name, receive it. Amen and amen and amen. Family, thank you so much for hanging with me tonight. You know, we're teaching the gospel in very difficult circumstances, but the Lord is faithful. Amen. The Lord is extremely faithful, and we thank God for your lives. If this platform is ever a blessing to you, you have an opportunity to be a blessing to us. All the details are on the screen. 
All the details are on the screen. And I thank you. Please, if you are sewing, please use your name as a reference so that when we do have specials on our uh, different platforms, you will then be included in that. So when you are sewing, please put your name so that we can see your name and we can include you when we are running any specials. God bless you. God keep you. You continue to pray for us. Pray for my family. And uh, let God be glorified in it all. Love you. Bye-bye.